Okay, so welcome guys for making it out here. I think I have seen some of you in the previous ones, but um, if not, then my name is Carlos. I actually just take it. Um, so, just basically what we'll be talking about is uh, kind of give an introduction for why we want to have compostable SQL generation. So, um, who here works with SQL, SQL on a daily basis? And are you, I don't know if you guys are typing like raw SQL or using some kind of library, but uh, I find it that typing raw SQL is very error prone. And well, that's kind of like the first part. And uh, to do that, actually, I'm gonna do like a little small application with a little bit of uh, whimsical details to just kind of showcase um, most of the features that you can find. Um, in both Haskell Relational Record and Opalite, which is the, what we'll be talking about. And then just some considerations, basically. Uh, okay, so that's me, Carlos. I'm not a Haskell programmer on my day-to-day -day basis. I have been working in Java, Scala, and PHP for the past four years, um, mostly at a business levels, so I don't write compilers for a living or anything like that. Um, then I also have a little bit of experience in other languages, uh, mostly there. But uh, recently, not too long ago, I uh, became a newfound love with Haskell. Um, like it was always there, I did get acquainted with it like most of you in university and there was always kind of like lingering. Um, and I remember always when I was writing on these other languages, feeling like that kind of longing, like, oh, maybe I could do this, but uh, if I was just writing in Haskell, so. <laughs> um, Scala goes a long way. I think I, one day I read something that Scala is like a gateway drug into Haskell. Um, so I kind of eased my tension a little bit, but Haskell is definitely my focus in the past few months. Um, so then, there's a lot of, that we'll be doing here, but we're mostly concerned with the results of, um, because some of the queries might not be optimal, though it's kind of hard to get a non-optimal query in the small data set that we'll be working with, but um, it's mostly just related to uh, results. So if you see something that may be unperformant, you can shout it, but just don't shout it too much. <laughs> um, another thing is that we don't want to confuse ORMs with query generation, right? Because ORMs are mostly related to, I mean, ORM, just the concept of an ORM is like object relational map. So um, that's not really what we're aiming for. We're not aiming to map it, like specific data to a table. We're mostly also concerned, I mean, that we'll be doing that, but also query generation is more about generating reports and relating data together to get different kinds of um, structures. There is an ORM um, for Haskell called Persistent, which uh, may be worth looking at. And uh, we'll also be doing uh, working with Postgres, um, mostly because Opoli, which is the last thing we'll be talking about, is most is targeted specifically to, specifically to uh, Postgres SQL. So um, there is another version for SQLite, but was great is I think a little bit of a more realistic approach uh, skill light is like for more uh, um, local deployments I guess you could say um, and just basically to kind of get the terminology out of the way so when we talk about composability what we want to speak of is uh, how can I get I mean it's, it's basically the concept of modularity and how to reutilize what I've been defining before, right? So uh, don't repeat yourself <laughs> and make sure to get, uh, to be able to reuse small tested queries and to build more arbitrarily complex ones. Um, and type safety is obviously a big deal when we're talking about Haskell. Um, how can we get something that is naturally, I mean, SQL is more of a string-based approach when we're writing and we're communicating uh, with a PostgreSQL uh, backend. Um, so how, we'll see how can we add uh, type information 
to what we're working with in order to get a program that if it compiles, then we can be sure that the query is correct or valid, I guess you could say. Um, and in terms of validity, there's always, um, you can go down the rabbit hole pretty deep when you are talking about what is right or wrong uh, when generating queries. Um, so how can we say this is the right query? Well, neither has correlational record nor Opali can give you that guarantee, right? Um, but they go a long way into helping you not get the wrong query, I guess is what you could say. Um, yeah. Okay, so I am not, uh, I don't have the most uh, memory, so I decided that the application that I would do uh, was something to just keep track of my to-dos. Um, as you can see, it's very simple. I have like a small list of things that I have to do. Um, they're due by a specific date, and they have a priority, or maybe they don't, right? So the priority is just an integer, but maybe I don't wish to give a priority to something, so it's there. Um, and then just some of the specifications so that come naturally, right? Uh, I just want to find a to do, so just what I have to do on to do one. I want to complete them, uh, I want to add them, just to add a new to-do, so that's just like your basic CRUD, or without the update. Um, and as you can see from here, um, I also have like a sort of categorization through hashtags. So I just said, okay, I want to categorize my to-do with multiple categories, and then I just called it a hashtag. Um, so then we have like a little bit more, right, things. Uh, maybe I just want to do only the, like I want to see only the two news that are due by a certain date. And I also want to see them with their hashtags. Um, but then I also maybe want to filter by the hashtag. Or maybe I just want to uh, list those that are late. Um, which that was a bad one to be late, but it's late. And finally, uh, just get some reports, right? So if I have a list of to-dos and I have their, ha their hashtags and I just want to get reports on how many are already late, how many are in the future, how many belong uh, to a certain hashtag, how many don't have hashtags at all, and just get like more popular hashtags or whatever. So you can, as with everything, go uh, an arbitrary length <laughs> of where you take your program. Um, and this is database design. It's very simple. I know that in Postgre you have vector uh, types, but uh, I'm not going to worry with those right now. So this is just a one-to-many relationship. Uh, is everyone clear on this? It's just very simple. And well, actually, it's very important that we refresh our joints. I borrowed this image from the internet, um, but it's there, the, the credit. So these two are actually the most important ones that I want to touch base on. Um, this is an inner joint. Uh, this means that when I do an inner join, there is no notable rows, uh, notable fields in the rows, right? So this only means that, I mean, this event diagram, I will see it very easy to understand. It's just the intersection of two tables uh, by whatever predicate. Whoops. And this is a left join, which can nullify the fields of the second set that I want, that I'm joining on. And that's actually an important uh, thing to keep in mind. And if I lose anyone along the way, then please uh, shout at me or throw a bottle or something. Um, and then this is just some of the queries that kind of arise from everything, right? This is very simple, actually, so we're not going to concern ourselves too much with them. But insertions are actually important, because if you look at the previous slide, um, my ID is a serial, which means that every time I do an insertion, that ID is incrementing. So I don't have to provide an ID because the backend is going to provide it for me. Um, of course, in applications that are a bit bigger and clustered, you'd want to use something like a UUID, but in this case, uh, it's just an auto increment. Um, and these are some of the other ones that maybe I need, right, to comply with some of the options of the program that I mentioned before, right? Uh, like, if I want only the to-dos that are due by a specific date, or order them by priority, um, 
if I set one for them. Or the ones that are late, uh, then I also want to get those with the due date uh, that are in the past. And then, this is also one uh, that's important. So this is an inner join, actually, it's by default. Um, just the ones that belong to like a certain hashtag, right? And, and that are due by a specific date, uh, which is also one of the options of the program. And basically what I want to get to is that, even though it's not complete, um, I can mix the options that I provide to my program to get like kind of different output. And it would be very beneficial for me if I could do the same with the queries, because otherwise, by using a very simple library, which is actually a name, PostgreSQL simple, um, I can design my, my records um, in a way that I see fit, actually. Um, this, the important part is the get ID function, so when I build this record, I set it as a maybe, because again, it could be no when I'm trying to do an insertion, right? Um, so that's an important fact to take into account. And uh, with PostgreSQL Simple, then we make our uh, data types and instances of from row and to row. That's, uh, you can also take it a bit further down with, uh, with each field from, uh, with instances of from field to field, we won't be seeing those, but uh, this is just to kind of see this. Um, and again, what I said before, in the two row method, I'm not contemplating the ID because uh, I'm doing an insertion. So I'm just going to wait for, that, for the backend to provide me with the ID. Okay, so adding. Um, this is uh, kind of the, what we were looking at before. The first part, uh, well, the query method is actually going to run a query against the connection and return an, an array of Haskell. So I'm doing like a head function there. I mean, I'm mapping with head um, to kind of get the first result. So is everyone okay with uh, this insertion method? I want to get them out of the way to kind of get to like the juicier parts. Um, but basically, it's all about um, the to-do is going to go to the two-row um, implementation and then fill out these placeholders with the pertinent um, escape that. Um, is everyone here aware of how placeholders work with uh, databases and insertions and everything? Basically, as a uh, responsible programmer, you always want to use placeholders. Otherwise, you run a very big risk of <laughs> getting injected, uh, which is bad, right? So uh, with this method that is implemented in the to-do module, uh, I go to the commands module and I simply run it. Um, as I said before, the get ID was a maybe, so I set it as a nothing, and I just wait uh, to get a new ID, right? Um, Kind of goes the same way for uh, all to do's. As I said before, um, we write uh, the string in quasi quotes. This is the SQL quasi quotes provided by uh, the PostgreSQL simple. I don't know if everyone here is aware of quasi quotes, but if not, just raise your hands. Uh, basically, this will turn that into a byte string, um, but it's just an easier way of writing it because otherwise writing multi-line strings uh, can get a little bit of a hassle. And um, we'll see, actually we'll talk about that a little bit more further on. Um, so that's for all to use. And then to find a specific one, it's basically the same query but with a restriction, right? So if the quality code is actually done, it's only and converted into a byte string? Nothing. Queries in PostgreSQL simple. Um, this is basically a query type, and it's a byte string. It's a new type over a byte string. It's because it, in the back it just uses the C um, library for connecting to PostgreSQL. Yeah, and that C library is based on you give the query as a byte string. It parses mm -hmm. it, searches for the placeholders, and then you save the different that. Yeah, okay. and as we learned from the previous meetup, byte strings are more efficient, um, but they don't support a bunch of the characters, which is actually also like 
a good cue that you should use placeholders instead of like concatenating or doing anything risky like that. Um, and then deletion. Deletion is also quite simple, though this method is a bit longer because well, I'm trying to find it first and then also just checking that I effectively deleted something. But uh, maybe there's a chance that I didn't find it. Uh, and otherwise just print it and say, okay, good job. If anyone needs uh, to see a slide or something. Why don't you do that in a transaction? Sorry? Why don't you do the find and delete in a transaction? Because now you can have the case that two deletes are issued at the same time. I mean, two run complete commands are issued at the same time. Yeah, you're right. Thing. Yeah, um, actually when I was looking at this I thought also it looks a bit fishy, right? <laughs> uh, but you're right. I mean, ideally you'd want to run this within a, a transaction, but uh, with PostgreSQL Simple you get like auto commits whenever you run. Um, so, I mean, I think you can also start with do like transactional, but yeah, I mean, you're right, so. Well, hopefully it's easier to do with uh, libraries to be sure. <laughs> um, actually, yeah, we'll see that in a little bit. Okay, so just kind of iterating over the same uh, issues as we saw before. Um, I want to kind of contemplate all the to-dos that I do by a specific date um, or that are late um, or, or order by a specific clause. Um, so then I'm basically just typing out all these different combinations, right? So um, though this library is great, there is a few issues there and then. Um, first of all, it's repeating myself, which is always error prone because the more I repeat myself, then the more likely I am to make a mistake. Even if it's just like innocent or really trivial. Um, so if I did want to re reutilize, then maybe I could do screen concatenation, but that's dangerous. It's a very ill-advised um, and would not recommend. Especially because you run the risk, right, of doing something that then you can't understand and it becomes increasingly complex to understand and reason about the code. Um, this last point is actually, well this very last, the last point in this particular slide, it's not so bad because um, the from row and two row instances will actually throw a compilation error if I were to change my record. Um, but you have to kind of go there and the errors become a little bit hard to read on. Um, again, when we're when we're implementing two row and from row instances, field is uh, it acts like as a row parser, um, but it's not really a name, right? It's always like field, field, and uh, addressing things by their name is always convenient. Um, again, writing something in a quasi code is really easy to get wrong. I mean, if I'm constantly repeating myself, maybe instead of writing like select, I write select or something, or I can get the order of the columns in the wrong uh, in the wrong way for later to the applicative to, to try and build that record and get it wrong. Um, if I get the types of my record wrong, as related to the table that I'm querying, um, it's also gonna throw an exception. And it's overall just very easy to make like innocent or trivial mistakes that the program will still compile, but I, but it will fail immediately once I try to do anything. And as Haskell programmers, there's always like this sort of mantra that's repeated, like if it compiles, you ship. Um, and this kind, of, <laughs> yeah, and this is kind of like a little bit of that buzzing in the back, like no. Um, but there are always like certain degrees of a no, right? And this is like a huge no. Because my program is compiling, there's everything seems okay, there's no warnings, and I'm still, the second I run it, it's gonna fail, right? So this is actually also in the code samples. Um, there's a call a bad to do, and what I'm doing is the date that was originally defined as a day, now it's just a string, and when I run it. 
It's just saying, hey, um, I got the field of this table, which is a date, but uh, you're trying to tell me it's a string. And this program is a program that compiled, yet I'm getting an exception like right away. So at this point, does everyone see uh, why we'd want both composability and type safety um, in how, however we're generating queries? The main goal is to make sure that when we compile our program, that we get something that is as less wrong as possible, in a way to say. Um, so, one of the solutions there is a uh, has correlational record, um, which is developed by, I don't know how to pronounce the name, K-Bino, <laughs> I suppose, um, at Asahi.net in Japan. Um, and I included this because I think it's always nice to see like all the dependencies you have to get. I think this is like the minimum that I had to include in my cabal file just to get it something uh, mildly useful. Um, and this is actually an interesting one. Like you can see it later, but uh, compilation time takes a little bit long. I don't know why, but maybe we can discuss that later. <laughs> just as a tangential. Okay, so important uh, things that always concern us. Uh, I know that a lot of people are not the biggest fans of template Haskell and Haskell Relational Record does a method of what's called bootstrapping with template Haskell. So what we do is we define our connection and our defined table and we use it with template Haskell in each of our modules. And this is what it's saying is uh, look in the public schema for the table to do with a derived show. And the, what this is going to do is going to generate our record type. Uh, and then you also need a database connection on compilation time, right? Because it's going to tap in and uh, look at everything that we need. Um, it's going to generate records with, uh, with, a, with fields. Uh, so it's kind of like the record style of uh, uh, with case. So what do you mean exactly that the database makes no meaning between compilation time? Is it that it, that it actually call connect to the database? Yes. Compile time? I compiled time with template Haskell. <laughs> yeah, and I was expecting like some eyebrows to get raised uh, with this one. And I think it has like its upsides and its downsides, but I think we, we can discuss that later. But uh, sure. yeah, um, that's actually a very, very I was expecting that, so thank you. <laughs> um, and it's gonna generate, right, like the types of my... Sorry? I wanted to say, it also allows you to use completely new terminology, like, I compile the database away. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and I think this is one of the things that always kind of, people just kind of automatically go like, what? <laughs> um, and it was weird for me also, but uh, you do need one. Um, well, I have to define the uh, define table method also with uh, with the driver. Um, it's gonna the types of my fields is gonna be automatic. Also, you can override that by just on a default you have that, and uh, you can check this reference there to kind of see how each uh, maps to the post trade data type. Um, Right? And it's going to do a lot of things also for us, which I will try to go right now over. Um, first of all, as we said before, it's going to generate my record, uh, my, my data type to you. And then it's going to generate automatically for me the queries of select, update, insert, but not delete. Um, and the important part to take into account from now on is that it's going to generate what's called a relation. And it has to go relational record, um, the relations are what are composable. And the relation tells me, when I look at it, this is, to-do is a relation that takes no placeholders and outputs a to-do, or an array of to-do. And it also generates what's called a pi. And uh, I think they're called that because when you look at the specification, the uh, they use 
the pi uh, to specify how transformations are done. And basically, pi's, as it says here, it tells me that id, um, ID prime is a pi um, on the to-do record as an int32, as, as well as the due date, the priority, which can be null. I think, I don't think I've been mentioning that before, but I did say that uh, priorities can be null or not, can be nullified. Um, and the title, which is done to a string, right? So by default, you get this. And as I said, you can override these types. Um, but that's what it's going to generate for you. And the important thing to take into account is that when has correlational record grabs my to-do and turns it into a relation, it's going to treat my record as a list. So I don't know if that makes sense yet, but uh, try to keep it in mind right now. We'll see why that makes sense later. Um, just imagine that it takes my record and it's going to treat it as like a list of columns. Um, and we'll see why that makes sense later. And the pies actually are nothing more than an array index with phantom types. So is everyone here uh, familiarized with phantom types? Yes? No? No? Ones. Okay, so great. <laughs> phantom types um, are just adding additional type information to my data. So if I were to get rid of all this noise, and just say that ID was like a mere zero. Um, but I'm telling the compiler that this has additional data. So it's saying that this zero can only be used within this context. And that it's going to also uh, be of that type when I get the column, right? So I don't know if anyone wants to add like a little bit of a better explanation. But phantom types are basically about getting additional type information to my data types so that the compiler so that and then use that in a in a sensible way to make sure that the compiler tells me errors when I'm trying to make things that don't make sense. Does that make sense what I just said? That was a bit of a mouthful. And uh, you wanna add something? No, I mean more for the pies, I, I think you can also call them projections. So that's Yeah, and actually that's what they are, but uh, yeah, I mean, a projection in a correlational record, the, the, the naming can get a little bit uh, confusing when you're using them. Um, so do they also have a type projection? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but a projection is what I get when I apply a pi to a relation, and uh, we'll see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, on phantom types. Uh, phantom types are just additional type information that I'm not gonna necessarily uh, is that it it's mostly based uh, on the concept of programming at the type level so yeah it's uh, additional information for the compiler to make sure that I'm doing something that makes sense and not mixing types um, there was a good example on uh, if you were to have like a distance uh, data type and uh, you don't know if that distance is in kilometers or in miles right but in the end, your representation of a distance is just like a double, right? So uh, you can do like a, it works almost like a tag, right? So you tag your distance type with kilometers, but at the end it's a double, but when you try to add them, if you're trying to mix these data types, right? They say, but well, you're trying to mix miles with kilometers, that doesn't make sense. And that's where data, and that's where phantom types are really useful, for example. Um, you could also use generalized algebraic data types, but uh, has correlational record uses phantom types. Um, so for find, we simply do like the what comes with our uh, generated code, which is just select to do. Um, there's some auxiliary methods there, which uh, you shouldn't concern yourselves too much right now with. Um, for adding, I'm going over uh, a little bit right now of adding and deleting because I think that once you adapt a uh, library, you want to get, you want to use that toolkit, right? So since this runs on top of uh, HDBC, you could just type it out, but they also, but that wouldn't be type safe. So you, 
want to, as much as you can, use um, what's provided, right? Um, the record that it generated for me, the to-do, it didn't have a maybe int. So in order to get like uh, a partial, then I just created what I uh, call a high to-do, um, and it's just that partial uh, to-do record. And then what we create again is a projectable uh, placeholder with what we'll be seeing in a little bit, which is what uh, has called relational record calls a projectable applicative. And yeah, we'll see that because it's a little bit more complicated to explain right now. Um, but you can think of it as what we saw before with applicative about building records. Um, and it can get a little bit messy. Um, when I have my insert to do method, um, it returns what's called an insert query. And again, I always want to use placeholders as much as I can. Um, I could, of course, just provide it without uh, any placeholders, but I've never felt safe doing that. So um, I would invite you to study this, uh, but it's basically just saying derive an insert query um, for a placeholder using that pi to do, which is the projection. So it's saying that it's going to take that as a placeholder and generate an insert query. Um, and then I can generate my partial record here. If that doesn't make sense, uh, don't worry because it did it for me for a while. Um, until I kind of finally got the hang of it. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to go back, just please shout. Um, and then there's an alternative way to uh, do inserts. Again, with derived insert value method provided by Haskell Relational Record. Uh, this uses what's called an assigning monad, and for and it's a bit easier to do. Um, this just generates. I mean, the placeholder is going to generate like a uh, a tuple with my placeholders, uh, and then nesting can get a little bit messy because, um, as we'll see in a little bit. Haskell Relational Record provides nesting with tuples, um, and that's pretty much your um, where where, you're, where you, the most that you can do is tuples or records. So this is just tuples, and it's inserting the values of my to-do there. One of the issues that I had is that uh, with these derived inserts, I couldn't get the returning ID working as I did with uh, Postgres PL simple. So um, I did open up a, a ticket, a ticket. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did try to reach to the creators, but I don't have a reply yet, so uh, that's probably there in the future. Um, and then deletes are also a little bit tricky. Um, because derive is, is going to be, I mean, it, it's suspecting I mean, it's very hard to explain, actually. <laughs> um, the placeholder method uh, returns a tuple. And the placeholder method returns a tuple. First value is just dummy values with phantom types, um, which is telling me that's an in 32 But it also returns what's called a table derivable. And that's what's using to derive that I'm trying to delete a to-do. And uh, yeah. And, when I run queries, or when I run inserts or deletes uh, in HDVC, I always want to commit at the end, because it's transactional by default. And now that's when we start to get into the most interesting part, which is building relations. So the way that I build relations in Haskell Relational Record is with a method called relation. And that's expecting a monad in the parameter. Um, there's different kinds of monads, and the relation met, I mean, the method that I use to kind of build a relation, so there's the relation function, but there's also an aggregate relation function, will determine the type of monad that's later getting returned, right? So, as we see before, a relation is expecting a query symbol that is flat 
flat is another phantom type. Uh, it's just saying that it's not an aggregated uh, result. That means that you can build a record out of it. Um, and then what I'm doing here, which is the most interesting part, is that uh, I'm getting the to-do that was generated for me from the to-do module. Uh, with the query method, I'm getting that relation and I'm deconstructing it into a uh, projection. Projection is what we've mentioned before, right? And the projection uh, is a new type over an array of projection units. <laughs> um, and you can see this operator is a little bit confusing, uh, but it's very similar. I mean, if you were to have another exclamation mark, then it would be the uh, array index operator, right? So when you want to get a value from a, an array, you say exclamation, exclamation, zero, one, or something. Um, and this is basically what we're doing here. Is, uh, we're saying, give me all the to-dos, and now just telling it to uh, order by descending uh, with this column that I'm extracting from, uh, from the projection and then also return it to kind of make it into query simple projection flat. Does that make sense right now? A little bit? If it's a little bit, then I'm happy because it took me a little bit to understand how the semantics of the, of the ADSL work, right? So, um, but hopefully it makes a little bit more sense as we go along. Okay, so again, um, if we want to have placeholders in our relations, then we say relational prime, which is uh, normally in, in Haskell relational record, all the methods that deal with placeholders will uh, have a prime. So it's relation, relation prime, aggregate relation, aggregate relation uh, uh, prime. And uh, by composing it with the placeholder, then I get um, then I can use that in a, in a compound um, and do that comparison. So again, the operators that you're going to see are normally what you are used to. So equals, greater than, less than, uh, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, but with the dots there. Um, and because you have to take into account that all we're doing all this time is just generating SQL queries. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, what we're doing is generating strings, right? So all that this is doing is just making sure that the strings that we're generating, all these little pieces that we're building, uh, make sense um, from the values that we are talking about. And that we're not, for example, like, the phantom type of this relation, um, the placeholder it says it's an in32, and that is going to return an array of hash tag. Um, and the way that it does that is because here I get a narrow projection from hash tags, and um, this to do ID has a type, right? Um, it's saying to do ID is part of the hash tag module, and it's saying that the value of to do ID is an in32, so it's automatically deriving that and it's uh, making use of that in the relation. Um, so then when I actually run that query, it's going to be expecting an in32 to be provided to it, otherwise it won't compile. So this relation type, it's, it's saying essentially it's, it's a function from the first type argument to a list or array of the second type argument, is that right? I don't... Um, I mean... Obviously, behind, I mean, it can be interpreted to a query and perhaps yeah. other interpretations, but functionally, that's that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, when you run it, you have to supply it with an Can interview. you compose relations, for example, as a you know, category style, so that if you have a relation from int32 to hashtags, and the relation from hashtags to to-dos, for example, that you could take these two, compose them, and say, I get a relation from int32s to uh, to-dos, which will correspond to all to-dos that have the same hashtags uh, as the one which you identified. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, but the way that I would do that, at least from the, what I've been using it, is that um, I would just do it as a as building it up here. Like at the end of the day, um, relations. Well, I mean, query simple and query aggregates are uh, state monads, and what they do is they build up a stack of all the queries that we're making. So um, you can do what you're talking about. So you can just get uh, queries and hashtag, but it's not. I don't think you can do it like in a in a category manner, like with composition through some type of operator. So you have to kind of, it's a little bit of manual work, right? Um, okay, I mean, I just wonder, is there a category instance for relation? Because it looks like there could be one. Does it? I mean, you have few the, the inputs now. The first one in theory two is this you write a single value, you know? Okay. And you get a, a many, many values out yeah, of it. So then, then you would need to create, then you would end up with multiple relationships for each of the outputs of the first one? So for each result, you also have an SD query. Like if I find from my to do a hashtag, mm, right? So this hashtag, the right. I do the, the query again. I mean, it's not a super useful category. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'm just, I mean, trying to understand sort of what what this this. There object. is like no formal instance of a relation to a category, but maybe it's worth trying. But well, as far as probably it's not useful. Just <laughs> <laughs> discussed. Um, okay, as uh, usual, if I lose somebody along the way, please shout at me. It was, it took me a, a, a lot of uh, shower thoughts to, to finally understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now my naming abilities are going to start to shine. Um, but we're starting to get into composability. So before I define this to do's by priority, I said deconstruct my to do relation and extract the preo and get a descending, which generated this over here. And now I want to say, okay, I want it by priority, but before a certain date, right? And I applied the same principle as before with my placeholder. I get the to use by priority as the first statement. And then I use the where's uh, function and give it a, a compound expression saying only those before a placeholder value that I will supply when I finally run this query. And it generates this kind of uh, semi-readable structure, right? And it's also interesting to mention that the placeholder values that I can use are those that are called by the Haskell relational record people SQL projectable, right? Which are defined here. And it's just basically saying, how do I turn a day into, a, into an SQL, um, well, into an SQL value, right? Um, so what you can do is if you have extra types that you want to use in your placeholders, then you'd have to define them yourself. But uh, if you go back, I think yeah. just just the aside, uh, I think you're missing an order by on the, on the output query. Sorry? I think you're missing the order by on the output query. Yeah, it's in the inner query, like right? that is the by. Um, I don't think SQL allowed, basically, I don't think SQL guarantees that this is going to survive the output query. Actually, um, but that's, that's not a problem. Yeah, I mean, that's probably worth testing. We'll see later how actually Haskell Relational Record has a lot of drawbacks. A lot of them pointed out by uh, Tom Ellis, which is the creator of OpenLife. <laughs> um, so does everyone see the before that method there? It's actually kind of simple. Uh, but then we can actually keep iterating, right? And what I mentioned before is if we keep Taking this uh, now, instead of getting like all the rec the, the entire record, um, I only want to get a tuple with the ID and the title, and that's 
what this operator is for, uh, which is essentially the same as that, so it's only just like a little shortcut. Um, yeah, and uh, for, for tuples, um, a correlational record provides a first prime and a second prime function, um, which are kind of, uh, in my opinion, when if you return like Right now, I'm returning like an n32 in a string, but if these were records, um, I'm still kind of doubtful on the first and second, uh, how they guarantee type safety. That was a bit confusing to me. Um, but they're there, so when you return tuples, you can deconstruct them using these ones, um, which is just basically, this is a zero and this is a one. Are there types pi of tuple a something to a? Sorry? So don't aren't these just these pi types from tuple to the con constituent? Or what what's the type of first prime? Yeah, the the first prime is actually I think it has like no type I have it over here. Yeah, um so in the first part it's just a top of like A B oh yeah, I can just actually show you. Yeah. Does that does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it's just gotta make sure that it's what they call a persistable width, which uh, I think is too much getting into right now. But it does make sure that you're operating within a tuple, um, and basically it's the same type as that. And Second, oops, is again more of the same thing with the. Um, yeah, does everyone see that? I don't know if it's too readable with the black. <laughs> okay. So, what in that case, I mean, they are type safe. So yeah, I, I, I yeah, was wondering. Yeah. Right, very statement. Yeah, for actually, uh, so that actually clears it up for me as well. <laughs> but you're right, yeah. Um, yeah, so we can keep going. Again, um, this is the result of just building on top of them, right? Because to do by priority and before date um, are actually, is actually already composed, right? And the interesting part about this is that to do by priority and before date had a placeholder in it. So instead of doing query, I'm doing query prime, as I mentioned before, methods uh, that have placeholder values in them. And uh, this returns a tuple. And when I want to actually get the, re the relation, like uh, return the query again, then I also have to make sure that I'm using that tuple to kind of carry all the placeholders so that we don't lose any information. So do you always get nested SQL queries as you build on, like the more, so you started from whatever, to-dos, like all to-dos query, and then you added more and more Yeah. Queries, and you just end up with more and more nested, nested in, in the... In yeah, the in the end, it's always, uh, like when you print them, you can see that there's a pattern, right? So you start out with like a... With so some of the, the innermost queries, what, what you start from in Haskell, and then it just builds layers. Yeah. Yeah, it starts to like build uh, the inside. Um, it's the I don't know for all the how performant this will be. For example, like I know this is about performance, but um, for other backends, I know Postgre has a pretty good query optimizer that where this is not like a huge issue. But um, I don't know for other backends, right? Like. Um, if I've been working with MySQL for a long while, not currently, but this, uh, I'm not too sure how that would work out because I was writing like raw SQL for most of the time, um, but I don't know how, how great it would be to like optimize that into something that's sensible to be working with on production, but for Postgre, that'll work fine. Yeah, I guess it basically depends on how good the query optimizer is. Yeah, yeah, it depends uh, hugely on that. Um, yeah. 
Do you know if it provides you with a way to somehow convince it to give nicer aliases to things if you want to debug the SQL queries? Um, because I can imagine that if, if you build up very large ones and then at some point something doesn't work, you might want to check. Yeah, that. that's indeed correct, but I don't think so. Um, I've, I've been reading quiet on it and like, I haven't seen it in any part of the documentation if you can do something like a prettier kind of printing. Um, but when we get to OpenAI, you'll actually see that this is nice in comparison. <laughs> it also looks like it would be relatively easy to fix if, I mean, for like all the fields, if you were to check, draw, give a hint on how to name it. Yes. Yes. So it's really just a matter of implementing it. Yeah. And you can kind of catch up. You would, I mean, you could have the hints all in template Haskell generated yes. associated with such exactly. in the back. Um, and actually, this is not the actual output of the show for a relation. Like, I formatted it for you guys, mm -hmm. but it's just like, like a huge thing. So I guess if you can take online some kind of SQL pretty printer or something, then that would be like a good, a good tool. Uh, but again, I think it's not so unreadable, the output, but that just depends. And um, also, you know, real world situation, uh, I don't think that, I mean, it depends, right, but I don't think you are, are You are basically trying to get away from that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Not too much, but... <laughs> um, okay, so then going back to what I mentioned before about uh, PostgreSQL simple, now what I'm doing is I'm rationalizing about the data types that I'm working with and like what everything is returning. So that's like a more sensible way of working, uh, especially when we're talking about Haskell again, right? So we can start to kind of, a little bit, um, go back to our mantra, if it compiles. Um, but, <laughs> right? Um, well, it compiles if you have a database. <laughs> if there's a database connection in the back end there. Um, so I did mention before the left joins and the inner joins, right? And, and left joins nullify if there is no matching record uh, on the right side on the relation which I am joining. Um, then it's going to be like a bunch of no fields, right? And, in, uh, and to express that with Haskell relational record, I can use the query maybe method on the second uh, set which I'm joining. Um, and then I can provide it with a predicate, with a compound. Um, and then a lot of things change, right? Because now I'm saying maybe there's one or maybe not. So that operator changes since that's not really a hashtag, that's a maybe hashtag. Um, and then since I can't compare it with this, then I have to just use the just uh, method provided by Haskell Relational Curry uh, to kind of get those types aligned. And here I'm returning again uh, just a tuple of the two of to dos and hashtags. Um, and what I'm going to do now is okay. So now I only want the to dos without the hashtags, and that's what I mentioned before. Uh, I'm getting, I'm decomposing again this one. I'm getting it. Um, I'm assigning these two uh, names. I'm adding a restriction with the is nothing which is, uh, it kind of keeps the naming scheme of maybe, but this is basically saying where the to-do ID of hashtag is null. And then I'm reconstructing this again. Um, though, here, um, it could have been more simple, uh, it could have been simpler to just say return to-do, this to-do, return here. So I, uh, I went the, a little bit of uh, the extra unnecessary mile with applying the projectable applicative. Um, but if you were to have some sort of record there, then you could build it from uh, both of them um, using the projectable applicative. And I haven't really spoken too much about projectable applicative, but it's basically saying, once I have all these columns, how, I'm gonna, how am I going to just bring it back into this record, this type? Okay. And to most effects, you can uh, think of it as an applicative, but not too much. 
And then uh, by showing this again, uh, we're simply saying, okay, now show me what I just talked about. Um, and you can see, right? So this is doing the left joint, which can notify the second uh, table, the second fields of the table. Of, yeah, the fields of the second table. <laughs> And, uh, and before what I did was just grab that one and add a restriction and that's kind of what is pressing here, right? So it grabs this one and it just adds a restriction. Okay, so we haven't really spoken about much about aggregating um, and this is kind of the semantics of that. So I want to count all the to-dos that are late and again, Aggregate relation doesn't have to have the prime, but if you're going to use a placeholder, then you have to use that prime. Um, just compare it, just get all the to-dos, compare it with the placeholder that's provided, and then run the count function. Um, and this monad, this query aggregate monad, um, when deconstructed, it's going to be a projection that is not flat, but rather aggregated. And again, those phantom types I go a long way into making sure uh, that I am doing sensible things. And this is just to kind of hammer more on the whole idea. Uh, when I'm doing like, are you guys familiar with group by having? So I do a group by and I return uh, my, uh, my aggregated column, but I want to filter that somehow, right? Um, and this is what having does. So it's saying uh, the compound, um, well, the expression of count, it has to be bigger than uh, a value. So you can build values for a correlational record using that method. And then, uh, well, I provide a little bit of type information for the one, which is in. Um, and again, I'm using the aggregate relation method, which means that that monad, uh, it's going to be a query aggregate. Okay, so again, uh, you don't have to actually uh, take this one into, um, into account too much, but again, just to see this, that we saw before that some projections could be flat, but this projection is aggregated. And as I said before, um, once, as you are building, it's accumulating um, context in a state monad. Right? And uh, well, this is more of like a little reference, but um, does everyone see kind of the principles of how Haskell relation over record works at least uh, a little bit? If I lose anyone, <laughs> again. Okay, Opali. I guess um, personally, if I may give a personal opinion, I liked it way more, um, just to kind of give you like a little preview. Um, okay, it's not, temp it's not totally template Haskell free, right? Um, and I think you will find that some features are, will also raise some eyebrows, but overall I was really content. Um, so, my new definition for to do, I generate, I mean, I always type it as I did before, like when I was writing in Postgres Simple, uh, but I make it polymorphic. And along the way, we've been seeing that sometimes I want my record to be full. Other times, I maybe don't have the ID because I want to auto generate, uh, like auto generate it from an auto increment. Um, other times, if I'm doing like a left join, then maybe those are all null columns, right? So, this is very important. And like, to do is, I didn't make like a null, like with a nullified columns of all the types, but it's important to do polymorphic records because it's gonna save us a lot of headache than when we're using um, Opalite. And, and what I'm gonna say, right, is I have my insert columns, which is a, We'll see these types uh, just in a little bit. Um, but the most important ones that I want to actually talk about is to-do columns. It's this record, but with column expressions inside. And columns um, actually are SQL expressions with phantom types. So column, 
depends on type, right? But they're just um, SQL expressions at the end. Um, and then this is what I call my Haskell. So this is when I want to actually talk about it. Um, then this is the important part. Uh, when I want to get the query, I want to get them in this type, in this format. Um, and you can see that there's PG text, PG date, um, and different kinds of types that I can use with my columns. And you can refer to uh, Opalite PG types later to see like a full reference of that. Um, okay, so another important feature is the dimension language arrows, which we'll talk about later, but also template Haskell um, for product pro functors. Is <laughs> I know there's a lot of uh, subjects that are coming up now, but is everyone here uh, aware of what a pro functor is? All right. No. I'm probably not like the most recommendable person to actually talk about pro functors, but they basically allow transformations, right? So basically, what I want to say is, how am I going to go from this to this? How am I going to go from this to this, from that to that, right? And the pro functor will say, okay, you can go from this to this in a certain way. And product pro functors will actually do that, but for the entire record, right? And I actually have like a little slide where it's kind of more visible. Uh, but when we say adapter and instance, well, this is the adapter, and it's going to make an instance of a product pro functor for, for two. Could you explain why yeah. you have to do ID column not being column pg int yeah. ID2? Again, the um, this is a type that I specified uh, in another module, which I actually should have made a little bit more explicit here. Um, because Opali makes it a lot easier to uh, deal with specific data types to make sure to add like additional type safety. Um, because before, we were talking about my ID as an int32 all the time. So what if I want to join on tables that make references to that to do ID, right? So I could be doing things that maybe don't make sense, like I could be joining my ID on any other type of int column. So by defining the specific data types, it's very, it's gonna go a long way into making sure that when I'm joining, comparing, uh, that I'm doing sensible things. Um, and we'll see that in a little bit. Um, okay. And does everyone see why polymorphic records are important? So I made this a polymorphic record and then I just specified what I want to use it for specific cases, right? So when I'm talking about two columns, then I'm going to use these ones. Um, when I'm talking about insertion, then it's a maybe, which is defined in another place, but maybe it just means that I can say supply nothing, and it will just turn that into a null. And then when I'm talking about, when I get it back from the database, then I want this representation. Oops. Okay, um, now I don't need a database connection when compiling my program, which it's really great. Um, but again, just scratching? Okay. <laughs> um, and since I defined some specific types, uh, there's a little bit of wrapping and unwrapping, for example, for my to do ID, and I kind of went like, again, a little bit of the extra unnecessary mile with the priority. Um, and I defined like a specific type for that, but it just kind of, it depends on how far you want to take it. Um, for example, like I defined a, a new type for my TUID, but maybe the priority was like unnecessary. But yeah, um, you have a lot of more flexibility when defining your records in Opalite. So what is this table type that takes so, two arguments? Yeah. So table, actually, thank you for bringing that up, because I was just going to skip it. Um, the first indicates the columns that I want to 
uh, when, that I want to specify when writing. And the second specifies the columns that I'm getting when, I, uh, when I'm reading. All right? And that's actually important um, because, again, when I'm writing, I'm saying that this one can be a nothing, and it most likely should be. Um, and here, I'm saying that it has to have a value, right? So when reading, the type system is guaranteeing that that has to exist, and it can't be like a null, right? So if you somehow had a null there. Does Opelheim have, I mean, how does it defend against the problem that you specify your table here, but there's an SQL schema on the deployed database that at some point it connects to, and it might well be that this schema doesn't match up with what you defined in your Haskell file. It so doesn't. How, how does it defend against that? It doesn't. So like schema change, I mean, it's basically the same problem as a schema change. Um, so well, you could even just be wrong. Yeah. Uh, so if it doesn't match, then... Yeah, it's, it's not going to protect you in that case because um, you you have to make sure that you're defining, I mean that your schema change that your schema matches your record definitions. Yeah. In general, you can't defend it. I guess that the question is whether the, the, the failure is going to be nice or whether it's going to does it do like some side checking or what it thinks it should be getting. Actually well, I mean, it's, it's selecting by column, um, like here I'm telling it that the, the types of these records are columns, which again, they're just like SQL expressions, and when I'm defining the table, I'm telling it which columns it should be looking for, right? So like ID, title, due date, and preo. Um, so if you change, like if you add a column, then I think your program is just going to run like normal because it's selecting these columns only, right? So whenever it's like tapping into your table, it's saying just give me these columns. So if you have an additional one, it's just kind of like ignoring it, right? Then so is your software. Um, but if you have one that's missing, then you're trying to select a query uh, a t uh, column that's not there and it's going gonna, it's gonna to explode. But you're going to have to wait until you actually use it. So like on compilation time, there is nothing to guard you against it. So Opelai is a lot right. safer, but there is no like bootstrapping uh, on compilation. So I think on compilation is too early because it might well be that the database you connect to at compilation is not the database you connect to in production. Most likely what I would expect is that if I connect, then with the connection I say, okay, what are my expectations on the schema of that database? Like it should, sorry. <laughs> it should contain all these tables. So actually I would like to have a, a type in Opelay for a database schema. I would say on a connection I would have to specify the schema which I expect and then it's up to me to make sure that I only use queries that adhere to that schema. So yeah, but, but it would guarantee that on this connection it's just gonna work. Yeah, um, that would be certainly useful but there is no mechanism for that as far as I'm aware. Like, um, for example, I've just kind of, along these thoughts, skipped over, like, um, a lot of frameworks, for example, will allow you to define your tables in the code and then run it and then, like, do migrations and all of these things, but um, Opelai is just kind of, it's just about querying. So it's not about, like, checking that your schema is of a certain expected type through Haskell and then going back and forth. So that's something that came up that I thought about a lot by now is uh, making this just like, um, you know, what if I suddenly just drop my column, you know, or what if I make a change? And, um, for Haskell relational records, since you have your types uh, generated by template Haskell, then you're going to get a lot of errors on, diff on the different modules where you're using that, and it's going to kind of like guide you through where you have to add or delete code. Uh, but here, then um, I did mention that this runs on top of Postgres Simple, or if I didn't, I do now. Opelai runs on top of Postgres Simple, which is very convenient if you're already running Postgres. Um, you're gonna get like an exception of one of these Postgres exceptions, like Postgres QL Simple exceptions. Like, yeah, I've tried to get like this column, and now it's just not there or something. So, so I'm just to make myself clear. I don't expect that this. Should be done here, or I mean, this is already 
this yeah. makes it already a lot nicer because you have to make sure, okay, tables are defined and match up with the schema and yeah. you have to make sure any deployment of that matches up. What I'm seeing is that you have all the information available to actually provide early failure on yeah. the connection. Like and if your service that's... starts up, it says, this is my database, it goes there and checks it. And yeah, you could yeah. even sort of frame And I think it would be nice and um, Opala is in still a relatively young project. So they're accepting like requests for things that you want to do, like, and I think, I think it's quite popular and sensible to talk about, like, hey, I, uh, I would like like early notification that I'm doing like something wrong, uh, but as far as matching up to uh, to your expectations, it's as simple as making sure that your records are kind of like, or your table definitions are kind of matched up to a table. The an existing table, right? And what I mentioned before in Postgres Simple, like when I tried to specify my date as a string type, it kind of crashed because I said, hey, this is a date, but you're telling me that you want a string and I can't do that, so crash. And this is still very possible. Like the first time I wrote any code in Opali, I got that. So, <laughs> and it kind of like told me, okay, uh, there's like no guard against this, um, but it's, I think it's early enough for you to check that on testing. Um, yeah. My guess would be that they don't do it on startup because somebody can still come while you have the connection open and just like alter your table away, right? So that it has a different schema. So maybe the cleanest way would be to provide like a function uh, that you can call at any time, uh, check that all my tables that are declared in Haskell are consistent. So that you can also do it in between. Yeah. Right? Well, I, I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't think you really want to defend against people just screwing up uh, your, your you know, uh, uh, database when you require them. Right? There's no defense against that. So I don't think you should be really defending against it. The only interesting question is really, like, what if most of my queries don't access fields full? Right? And so my many queries that I might connect and run a few, a few, other, a few of them to test it, they will just pass. But one of the fields that in the, in the table that I expect and that is very rarely used does not match up with the schema because I made a mistake, right? And then you have this, this possibility that, well, if I had like a sanity checking query that selects every, all the whole schema, check the whole schema, then that would be early rejection, right? Yes. Just like sanity check. Well, you could even reformulate it and say, what tests do I need to formulate such that if that test passes, every query that my program is going to issue Passes provided that the schema doesn't change between the tests and this. Right. And then we have a nice world where you have this if it compiles, it runs. It's just like if the process starts and the self test succeeds, it's going to work, provided its assumption about the environment do not change. Right. right. Yeah. The assumption so, you usually would not change the database. You would <laughs> shut down everything and then shut down the database, change the schema, and start again. I don't know, we were in production with live schema changes and that makes a lot of sense because many schema changes you can do live. I mean, okay, adding new tables, true. adding new fields. Yeah, that's true, but you're usually picking the times when the least amount of people are using that database. You don't want to pull the rug under people's feet. Especially in big organizations, uh -huh. that's my point. If a small number of people is using something, you can do whatever you want, but usually schedule it in the evening when no one is I think that depends on the application because global applications don't have an evening. Yeah. Okay. And that's sort of the yeah, applications I'm that. usually thinking about. And then what I expect is actually I need to be able to do live migration of all my databases. Um, yeah, and I just need to make sure that the old clients, that their assumptions are still valid for long enough until... Okay, yeah. And to be honest, yeah. I, I think my, my point was you want to crash as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, because then you can roll back and you would die, right? Uh, whereas if, if you change the schema and you know, there are very few users because it's easy and everything works, maybe they're issuing the queries that are not triggering your problem, right? They're not triggering the something that is missing in, in the expectation of the client yeah, like the uh, schema. So it's also where you're the catching the problem. Uh, I mean, from the environment where I'm coming from, uh, many there are many users of a database. A, 
if you change something, you change it with a good reason because you need additional fields or whatnot. Other people have different assumptions. So if their code is failing, they need to fix it. That's at least in my organization. That's why I'm mentioning this. That's why you don't want to roll back. You just continue and let the people fix once they encounter the problem. But you want to minimize uh, to do that while everyone is busy. You want to do it so that people can... I don't know whether I'm clear on this. Oh, interesting. So, so if, you, if you break other people, you have to be going forward with it. Yeah. And oh, what kind of part of this stuff? Uh, high frequency trading. Ah. Okay. <laughs> you just continue. Interesting, yeah. That's about where the frequency drops. <laughs> because what I would expect is that if, if you have a wealth, if you have a managed process for schema changes and you actually have a representation of any database schema, mm -hmm. so what you used to do at Better was that you had SQL scripts for every migration and they either fully migrated or did not and thereby you could also describe every database schema as it's the concatenation of these mm -hmm. So this actually enables you also to actually fully test out whether your schema change will break any time. So in particular if you have a mono repository and can ask this question of what are all my clients, uh, will they all work against this mm -hmm. schema? So um, I think I, I would prefer an organization that is organized like this because then you can just make changes without sort of hot fixes. Yeah, that would that be possible in your situation? I mean, it's no. apart from the historical legacy, but <laughs> no, I mean, your problem domain, yeah. could it be solved in that way? Uh, unfortunately not, because we don't know all the users of the database. That's the problem. Okay. Why is that? Because different teams require different uh, knowledge, so the database contains all the performance information, for example. So all the traits, uh, all the timestamps, everything that uh, they have, and sometimes people use it just to verify a hypothesis. And then they create a report that runs daily as a cron job. And you don't know who's doing this stuff, so if it breaks, it's their responsibility to fix it. That's, that's the thing. And okay. then, yeah, that, but I agree. If you have a monorepo, if you know who are all the users, it's much better to test. Failing fast is always the right approach. But my experience is that not many com well, some companies cannot afford to have such setup. Okay. Yeah. Especially when you're uh, all about iterating quickly and trying to find, uh, uh, just to validate hypotheses. Yes. That's my point. Yes. Right. So, um, past this point, um, just to kind of continue, I think those are great ideas, but unfortunately in Opalai, you have to make sure that when you define a table, uh, that your schema matches to the table that you're trying to talk to. And this table uh, constructor is always going to look up on the public schema of Postgre. So if you want to look up on an alternative schema, then you have to say table with schema. Um, so if you're namespacing that as you should. Um, and then we kind of have this first approach. Uh, to kind of get all the to-dos, it's as simple as saying just query the table to do table. And this is like the fundamental building block of the composability in Opalai. Uh, this is what most of my queries will start with, is like to-do query, hashtag query, and then just kind of build blocks from there. Um, and query. Query two columns is nothing more than an alias on query arrow with the unit as an input, so no input, and uh, as an output to do columns. And it's saying that um, every time I want to use that as an output, it's going to return an expression of those columns that I'm defining here. Um, and arrows are actually fun, but we won't get that there yet. Um, as I said before, I'm defining specific types which uh, guarantee, which just add like an additional layer in type safety. So in my file, in my module, um, again, I make like a polymorphic record called to do ID prime with that constructor. And again, I have to use like the make adapter and instance. And then the repo, um, I will also, I also have like all the splices that are generated by this, um, which I find interesting to look at. Um, 
again, you can we can talk about this for a long time. Um, it's interesting to look at the distinction between these two. So, like the first ones are again, this is like my Haskell. This is what I want to get to when I'm actually working with this data type. Like once I've read it, and this is like my expression of an SQL. Um, so we'll see how to make like column PG and four later. Um, but then these are important, right? Because like, what's the difference between a maybe and a nullable? And most of it, they just radicate on the fact that um, one is when I'm writing and one is when I'm reading. Um, yeah. And well, there is a lot of discussion about this expression over here, which I won't get into right now. But it's uh, basically you. The whole, I don't know if they fixed it yet or not. But you could nest like nullables, and it could get like a little. It could get trivially messy, but uh, it's worth looking into that. Um, and uh, again, in order to use to ID, in order to be able to make transformations, um, I have to use template Haskell for that adapter and to make that instance. And I think I had a slide for pro functors, but apparently not yet. Um, it's really easy to do inserts in the, using just the, the Opalite toolkit. Um, especially if you're already working on Postgres, so like you get a lot of the common things that you'd be doing. Um, return, insert returning is gonna return a IO with the an array of IDs. But since I'm only making a single insert, then I'm just getting the first one. And for to do, and I'm running just the run delete. And it's getting this predicate. So it's saying run a delete on this connection to the to-do table. And this is to-do columns, right? Um, so what I'm doing is I'm wrapping that to-do ID to get the column expression. And I'm comparing it. Um, and then I'm unwrapping the to-do ID supplied as an argument. And uh, constructing a column of PG and 4. Uh, just to kind of build that. Um, yeah. And as a very trivial example, um, I mentioned before that uh, before we were talking about monads, and uh, Opalite uses arrows. Now, arrows, again, are another concept worth learning. Um, I guess to put it shortly, they are another abstraction of a computation, right? Um, since query is a type over query arrow with a unit, then this would be saying, don't take any inputs, and then just run this. Um, so to do query is also a query. It doesn't take any input. That's why the unit is there. And it returns an expression of columns, which I'm just seeing it's called to do's. And then I'm unwrapping it and making that comparison. Um, and then this is what I mentioned before in regards to uh, the output. Um, this is what, when, when you want to print it, this is the kind of like the result that you get. And it only gets messier from here. Uh, but again, the query optimizer in Postgre is uh, really, really good. So we won't get too much into the concept of arrows. But basically, Opalai uses arrows because monads, I mean, arrows are more restrictive than monads. Um, there's a lot of discussion on arrows. A lot of people say that, I mean, there's uh, documents saying that they lie somewhere between applicative and monads. Um, but we won't spend too much time with them. Basically, they are more restrictive than monads. And they lend themselves to easier uh, static analysis because they make their input explicit, right? So if you can keep that in mind for a little bit, um, then, then we can uh, continue. And uh, maybe it'll make sense a little bit later. You don't have to use arrow syntax. In order to use arrow syntax, you have to enable the arrow pragma. Uh, and since they're arrows, then what we can do is just 
do arrow composition, uh, but that will take up a little bit more of your time. Um, and again, what this is saying is get all the, I mean, get the to-do expression, and then apply this uh, this compound expression with returns a column of PG bool. And in the end, when I try to print this SQL, uh, it's going to return basically the same SQL as it did before because it's essentially the same expression. Okay, so product profiles are extensively used in Opalab. Um, and basically, as I mentioned before, they, uh, they're just representations of transformations, right? So P1 is a very trivial one. I can just say plus two on a two on a two, and then it returns a four. But if I'm talking about tuples, then it's gonna apply transformation on each part of that tuple, right? And there's really no difference between there. You have in pro data profile to product. You have P1 up until 24, I think, or 26. I don't remember exactly. Um, but what we did is uh, we derived our adapter for our to do with template Haskell. And that means that what we can do is we can, this is what allows us to run transformations on our records when we are defining tables, when we're running them against the database, and when we're generating expressions. Okay, again, um, I did mention the to do query before, but now um, ordering semantics change a little bit, but they are not um, too painful. Um, so ordering by is a little simpler in my opinion than what it was before. Um, you have the toolkit for ordering by descending, descending with nodes last because that's important in Postgres. Um, and you can see the output of this over here. So it, again, it's kind of building up on top of uh, of what was defined before. Okay, so there is a difference between the semantics of a left join and the semantics of an inner join, right? Um, for left joins, I have to do what, it's very simple what uh, you have to do is uh, you just provide it with the queries of the tables that you want to join and as you see, it's gonna be expecting that on the second part of that tuple there is a, that they're all nullable. Because as I said before, left joins, you have the full set of the first table, and then the rest can be nullable. So um, it's important. And then you just provide it with a predicate on the join condition. And then as you can see, I had to actually tell it what is nullable, right? Um, and these are more compound expressions, but um, and then you can see the definition for a left join, right? Columns A, columns B, an expression that returns a compound expression. Um, and then it returns nullable columns B. Is there a parent missing? Uh, sorry? So the yeah, second to last line is missing a closing. Right. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, because I had to format this out, but I think I'm missing some parentheses when I was formatting, maybe I forgot it, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's not balanced. And um, how, I mean, this is a, the second to last argument would then be a this is, Haskell predicate. How would it translate that Haskell predicate to actually a query expression? Yeah, well, um, what we're getting here, right, is the first parameter of the left join is a query. And also, well, the second parameter also is a query. And here's where I'm defining this predicate, right? So maybe if I use my mouse, it's actually a little bit simpler. But the uh, predicate doesn't use the standard equality. I mean, it seems to have a different type than function arrow to bool. Um, actually, if you look at this, um, the parentheses, the missing parentheses would be here. Right in column PG bool. Yeah. So this is actually a function that is a tuple, like we're mentioning here. Okay. Right. And this is to do columns. That's why I can run this expression here, the, the type that I defined before. 
and this is hashtag columns with a, t I mean, with a predefined type. And these are nothing more than records of column expressions with phantom types. So as long as the phantom type associated to this is the same as this one, then I can use it in this uh, polymorphic comparison, and it's going to return a column PG bool as a result. And there's actually, um, yeah, I do apologize because that's confusing. That should be like that missing parenthesis there, but when copying from uh, GHC, I don't know why I lost the little bit more. Um, and again, just to kind of keep iterating on what we said before, um, again, I can use compound columns um, as an input value. Um, and here, what I'm actually doing is I'm getting a query error that is going to take like a day as an input. And when I want to build these, then I supply like the, the function that returns a compound expression to, the, to this function, which returns a query that's expecting a day. And this is how I provide inputs to arrows. Uh, that's arrow syntax, um, which again, um, I'm not going to get into a lot, but suffice it to say that the restrictions on arrows will prevent from uh, making references to something that might be invalid, um, and that way Opali generates valid, I mean, valid queries, and it's actually a lot safer than Haskell relational record. Um, Okay, so for aggregations, again, um, it's very simple to actually use your standard Haskell toolkit on, uh, on Opali because queries are instances of applicative and they're instances of functor. So I can just run like an F map on once I get this query expression of late to do's or future to do's um, and to kind of just give it back into saying aggregated by count and then just count. Um, however many future to-dos and late to-dos. And uh, count expressions will always return a PG int 8. So that's kind of like set in stone. All right, so what if, again, I want to, uh, before I did like, an, like a group by with having, and uh, this, the way that I'm solving it here, uh, since I don't have this kind of, uh, semantics available. Um, what I'm doing is I'm doing like a group by and count of the to do's like these with the hashtag amount. So it's getting the, for the hashtag table, uh, just group it by um, the to do ID and then just count how many ever, uh, however many hashtags are there. And that means that using the P2 pro, product pro functor, it says group by hashtags and count uh, the hashtag stream. Uh, so group by the to-do ID and count the hashtag, the hashtag streams. And then using an inner join with the result of this query, then I'm making sure that I'm getting all the to-dos with the multiple hashtags. So it's kind of a workaround for missing the group by having semantics. And uh, I invite you to, to uh, study this later. And this is just, again, another example of uh, an inner join for a group by having. Um, okay, and uh, just to basically tie the knot, we have the run query method for uh, Opali, which is basically saying, uh, just give me a connection, which again is a Postgres simple connection, a query with no input, and some columns and give me a Haskell. And it's expecting a product pro functor of query runner from columns to Haskells, and that's why we had to make the splices before, um, so that there's a way for the compiler to know that, hey, this is how I'm going to apply these transformations to get the Haskell values that you want. And uh, basic, and again, there is a, by the Brisbane Functional Programming Group, already a really good video on Opali, which would be very beneficial to watch. 
um, certainly got me a, a long way. Um, and it's highly recommended. It's there as a link. I uh, invite you all. And we've been, I've been talking for a long time, so. <laughs> um, this is not all the issues that you can find with either of the libraries. But uh, monadic approach in Haskell relational record make it, makes it very easy to break. And as a solution to that, they implemented arrows. Uh, but I didn't try it because it's like really, really short examples and it seems. But yeah, I mean, uh, again, I invite you all to try it with arrows. But most of the documentation and examples that you will find for Haskell relational record is monadic. Um, and Opala again, schema changes require code changes, something that we talked about here. There's no placeholder support, so they, I did try a bit of SQL injection with it and was unsuccessful. So uh, there's also lots of dis discussions about it, but essentially when you provide input, you just provide it and you build it with the uh, provided functions uh, by Opali. So if you want to create a column of text, then you use PG text or PG and four, PG and eight. And okay, bar card lengths are also not contemplated. And this is not like a full thorough list, but again, if you have like a specific bar card length and uh, you want to insert something that's longer than what you specified in your in your table, then uh, you're kind of not guarded against that. Okay, uh, Haskell DB actually is too much and then there's just some reading material. And I've been talking for almost two hours, which is a long time. So, um, if there are any questions. And so, yeah, maybe a bit of a, a devil's side of it. Do you think, uh, I'm looking at the, both approaches, Apple and, and uh, HRR, it seems like there's a fair amount of complexity involved and mental overhead to actually you know, work yeah. with this stuff. Definitely. Right, especially with PostgreSQL Simple. So, do you think it's really worth it? I think. I mean, there, that is a very good point. There is a very, I mean, at least for me, there was a learning curve, especially since I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, like, I'm mean, kind of like, for a few months, very, very focused on Haskell, but there was a lot of new things for me, especially when concerning like product profiles, arrows and everything. Um, so there's that learning curve. Um, but I guess if you were already running, on Postgres Simple, you would definitely give Opal a shot. I don't see, I mean, the way that you're, I mean, you're, you're once you kind of jump, once you kind of make that mental jump and you start to reason about it, you can start to generate, you know, arbitrarily complex queries. And I think the, the way that you start to reason about your data and how you can start getting it. I mean, it's, it's there's a huge benefit in that, and I mean you're already, I mean if you're already running on Postgres Simple, then I guess you can dedicate like a week or or something to kind of make a few tests with Opali, and if something is not like Opali, I mean if something is not supported by Opali, then you can always just write your queries as you normally would with uh, Postgres Simple. I mean, yeah, if I were running Postgres Simple, I would definitely try Opali. No, no question. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you.